Sound test. The sound of an Apple II beeping. Sound test. The sound of Super Mario jumping. Sound test. The sound of a modem. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Scott. Welcome to 20 Minutes into the Emulation Future. I work at the Internet Archive, which to many people looks like this. But also looks like this. It's a renovated church in San Francisco that has computers and servers that are providing access to millions of people. Items like books, movies, music, and most famously, web pages through our Wayback Machine. My title there is Free Range Archivist, looking for things to bring into the Internet Archive or to work with people to help them understand the kind of history that they have and why it should come online. When I started with the Internet Archive in 2011, we were supporting book reading, movie watching, music listening, but we weren't really supporting software playing. We had a whole bunch of software that had been given to us over the years, but there was no way to experience it online. We either had large zip files you had to download, or we had large ISOs or, or CD images that couldn't really be used in any fashion. So one of the things that Brewster asked me to do was to look at ways that we could improve playability. The archive provides a lot of access to a lot of people to materials they might not otherwise easily get to. And it was with that kind of an approach that we moved into emulation in 2012. I have not been blessed with being able to hear other positions that have been presented today. But I will say that I am definitely of the school that emulation is a good thing. Not only is it a good thing, it is the future. 20 minutes from now, 200 minutes from now, 200 years from now. We've discovered over time that we don't really keep machinery around. We don't keep environments around, especially in a non-digital format. Machines themselves die, disk drives stop, tapes stop being readable formats change. There's all sorts of reasons for digital material to go into a quick, deadly obsolescence that cannot be recovered from. However, there have been amazing advancements over the past 20 or 30 years to both read and to play back all sorts of computerized or digitized material. Thanks to projects like MAME, DOSBox, QMU, PCE. We have had video games, computers, even point-of-sale systems come back from the dead and be presented to people easily, quickly, and in their computers. One of the main innovations that came out of the Internet Archive's approach to emulation was to put the emulation in the browser itself, located inside of a JavaScript or WebAssembly form which we call the emularity. The emularity is actually a conflagration of multiple emulators and multiple loaders to allow a wide variety of machinery to be emulated in your browser instantly. Again, I've not been at the event that this is playing at, so I can't tell which of these issues have been approached. So I'll just go ahead and do them all. The first one is, is emulation even a solution? Yes. Yes, it is. Here's why. Emulation decouples the playback of software from both hardware, location, and context, and then provides ways to bring back whichever portions of that you need. Let me explain. When you have a piece of software and you are using it in its historical context, perhaps a microcomputer in the 1980s, there's a whole variety of experiences that are part of the computer experience. Everything from the sounds that the computer is making to the unique aspects of the video signal 
to the kinds of keyboard that you had, or perhaps what was going on in your life, or how you were affected by the first play of that software. If one revisits it as the person 20 years later, many experiences are different. The way that you think about computers is different. Televisions do not really present video signal in the same way. More often than not, the hardware that you have is no longer available. For a person who is particularly driven, you could recreate that environment, down to the look, sounds, and smells of a 1980s living room. Or you can focus merely on the sprites, graphics, source code, and the technical aspects of the software being recreated. Without emulation's power, flexibility, and ability to reimagine contexts, many advantages would be lost. I've had conversations with many different academics, reporters, and simply people who themselves played or wrote programs from history, who just want to experience the program immediately, even if it is stripped of these contexts, and emulation lets us do that. The biggest mistake was treating software like it was a commercial product and not a cultural product. Without its ability to be thought of as a piece of art, as a piece of writing, as a piece of experience to the human condition, software was relegated to the same place as twist ties and old garbage bags and old soda pop cans. It just ended up being thrown to the side. And so much of the human experience is now defined and experienced by and for software. Here's some images from some emulated programs. And on their own, they're wonderful to experience. But they're also, each one of them, a representation of human work, effort, and coordination. Engineering skills, artistic skills, that can be experienced both as fun products to play like games, or they can be studied as techniques or efforts by true, honest architecture and engineering. The possibilities are limitless. When I'm asked to talk about the projects we're working on, I'm less concerned about trying to explain the exact technical reasoning behind each choice. For instance, our move to WebAssembly over JavaScript over time, or perhaps how we're working about how to do specific disk images. To me, that's interesting, but what's much more important to me is to get across to people what's coming. Because as we get more and more complicated emulation, the emulation systems themselves become the standard platform. Something might have lived on an Apple II for 10 or 15 or 20 years, but on emulation, it's going to live there for a century. And I think it's important to both refine and experience working with emulators and understanding their unique presentation style and power. Try to imagine a world where you can call up any program that you remember, either through a general description or by roughly drawing it, or perhaps by reading about it and then clicking on the words and immediately experiencing that program. Or maybe seeing a routine from an old program living again and again and again, like an old part from an old engine that still has use and still does the job it was supposed to do. That's where we're headed. And I think people are getting hyper-focused on video games and they're getting hyper-focused on why we are doing this. What does this mean for certain kinds of sale or distribution Instead of realizing that this brand new paradigm is here, and it's here to stay, it's being used by millions of people every single day. All we're trying to do is bring it to the library context and to bring it to the historical context in the way that its inevitable progress will be hastened and reaching many more people as fast as possible forever.